Welcome to the itinerary. Today we are pulling up the blankets and getting cosy because we're talking about winter and how our tourism industry handles the chilly season. Joining me today are Anne Lockhart, the Acting CEO for Destination Queenstown, James McKenzie, Ski Area Manager for Mount Hutt and Project Director for soon to be opened All Puke Thermal Pools and Spa in Methven, and Jared Simcox, Business Manager of the Dark Sky Project. Team, welcome. Tell us please what sets winter tourism apart from summer tourism. Look, for our business, we look forward to winter because uh, for observing, for looking up at the night sky, um, it gets dark earlier. We can go out at half past six, be home in time for tea before it gets too cold. Um, and of course, the diversity of activities down here in Lake Tukapo, um really starts to change. So we can have people who are going up and enjoying the ski fields nearby and they might go to the hot pools in the afternoon and then they come down and go uh, observe and go to our astronomy centres here in Lake Tuckapo in the evening. And you can do all of that uh, before it gets too cold and miserable. And that's what we really look forward to about winter time. For us here in Queenstown, we've obviously got the um, wonderful advantage of having four ski fields in our proximity, in our area, two in Queenstown directly and two more over the hill in the Wanaka area. Um, we've got yeah, a huge number of experiences both on mountain and off mountain. Um, I like as um, Jared was just talking, um, we've got hot pools to in the evenings, 150 restaurants that you can go to and a myriad of other off mountain activities as well. So yeah, it's a true winter, a true winter resort. It's a little different uh, up here in Methven. We don't have 150 restaurants. We have got some cracking restaurants, a great Kiwi experience here in Methven downtown. But obviously our tourism really starts beginning of June when the snows start falling at Mount Hutt and, and then our tourism just goes from strength to strength. So it's all about skiing right now in Methven uh, during the winter. Got a fantastic product, some great investment going on uh, in this district around our winter uh, products. And, um, you know, it, there's just a lot of activity, a lot of energy. Um, through the summer, things are pretty quiet. We're pretty rural down here. And, um, you know, we have, it's not tumbleweed running down through the main street, but sometimes it's close to that. But in the winter, we just step up a gear and uh, and it's all on. So a lot of excitement and energy, people coming from all parts of the country to come and ski and, and really take on that real sort of adventure tourism component that we've got so much of uh, in this part of the world. Oh, fantastic team. Now tell me, what do you think the ideal New Zealand winter travel itinerary or tourism itinerary involves? The ideal itinerary for us is a mixture of on mountain and off mountain activities that I was just talking about before. So on mountain can um, um, include sledging, snowmobiling, um, over the other side of the hill we have driving on ice and we've got a number of um, mountain on mountain activities, obviously skiing and snowboarding goes without saying, uh, but then you know we've got a plethora of other activities that uh, people can undertake. So. You know, in a perfect world, um, again, um, people can move from Christchurch, the southern part of the South Island. We've got, um, obviously, right from uh, through the Canterbury ski fields, right down south, um, a huge offering for people wanting to partake in a winter holiday. Yeah, I just, uh, I think that's, you very much picked up on a good point there. I mean, I, I just spent the weekend at the Hermitage um, near Mount Cook, Auraki, mm. Auraki um, and, you um, you know, just the drive through the South Island uh, in itself is a fantastic itinerary. The scenery, the scenery is absolutely stunning. You've got snow-capped mountains. You've got these great little uh, towns along the way where you can stop, get a fantastic coffee or a pie. You've got the ability to engage in sort of really awesome activities like skiing and sledding and those sorts of things, real high energy things. Uh, but you've also got the ability to relax, swim in hot pools, um, have a fantastic meal. So. The, the itinerary, I think, has really got to take in all those components, but really, probably the most breathtaking thing of all of it is, is just looking out the window and going, wow, we're so lucky to be here, right? Um, I also I spent agree. the weekend at the Hermitage. Um, I'm, I'm picking up quite a good friend of mine in a couple of weeks' time for a South Island road trip. Um, so this has been a really hot topic uh, in my household. Um, and I think the, the, the perfect winter uh, itinerary in the South um, includes those iconic activities that we've just talked about. So skiing, 
snowboarding, sledging, um, enjoying those spectacular views. Um, but I'd also add, you know, seasonal food and and checking out some of our major cities that have a super diverse range of, um, I suppose, metropolitan activities. So looking at some of the events that take place in Otago, for example, um, the Dunedin uh, Midwinter Christmas, that's a really cool activity that people can participate in while they're traveling between ski fields and activities. Um, and I think that's what makes, you know, Otago and Canterbury so unique is that you can fly into Christchurch, swing by Methven, have a couple of days um, in that village, come past ours, do some stargazing, get up the mountain a couple of times and enjoy being in this modern Alpine village. And then you've got Wanaka and Queenstown to look forward to, which are those sort of more developed, more diverse regions. And then, of course, you can hop on your plane and either fly out to Australia or, or back to any of the other major hubs um, throughout Aotearoa. And now, James, you're here with two hats on today. I personally believe that hot pools, spas and massages are an essential part and a necessity when it comes to any ski trip. And so tell us a little bit about your new venture. We know that you are soon to open. Yeah, well, I guess we've got a fantastic little town here, Methin. Um, it's very much a ski focused town. There wasn't a lot of other things going on. And um, really, we're just sort of looking, the vision was sort of, what, how do we make this a bit more of a destination? Um, and, and I think really, the well-being industry is a really key part of um, of future tourism growth, and and we sort of looked at what we could do here in Methven. It's it's a pretty flat area. There's um, some fields. There's lots of sheep and cattle running around, and uh, you know how can we make something that's quite compelling? So we we looked at all those things, and then um, we found a fantastic site. It's got great views out onto the mountains. Perfect place for some hot pools. Um, really protected from the wind, but great picking up great sun. We looked at that sun component and go, well, hey, what can we do with that? Got a big site, so we decided to make our hot pool solar heated, um, so it'll be the first of its kind. And um, and then we've got this amazing source of water that's coming straight out of the glaciers from the Rangitata uh, River. So we're taking that water and using that in our pools. So we've got a, a brand that's built around source from the mountains, powered by the sun. Um, the pools themselves are pretty fantastic. Got a family sort of side to the complex, and we've got an adult exclusive area where we have a little bit more of a premium offering where you'll have entry to the spa, where you can get your massage therapies, beauty therapies, and all those sorts of things. So really quality, high quality uh, hot pools uh, product um, with um, great service, great food, all those other things you'd expect from a from a from a real sort of um, you know, uh, I guess um, established. Uh, tourism destination. So we're working pretty hard. We're about 10 weeks away from getting that up and running. And we all know Queenstown is a winter destination extraordinaire. Now, how reliant is the town on our winter activities? Well, we're very reliant on our winter activities, although it'd be fair to say that pre up until um, uh, pre, well, pre COVID, is summer was our strongest uh, period uh, where we had most visitation. However, we were very pleased to find last year that after we came out of lockdown that we had a strong winter season, albeit that it was a domestic only season. I think the spend was about 155 million approximately, which was 28% down on the 2018, um, sorry, 2019 season. So that was about a 28% decline. So um, without an international, without international visitors, who are mainly Australians during the winter, um, we thought that we did um, pretty well. Now, another thing that we all associate winter with are those long, dark nights. And Jared, I imagine that winter is really when things kick into gear for the Dark Sky Project. Uh, what can you tell us about this initiative? Who are your customer base and how is it uh, different between the seasons? The appeal for winter um, from a stargazing perspective is, is twofold. Um, the first is that we're able to get up the mountain or out to one of our observatories a little bit earlier. Um, so in the summer, last light doesn't really happen until half past 10, 11 o'clock at night. So you've got to be pretty committed to going stargazing, um, whereas in the winter we get away at about quarter past six. So it's considerably more accessible. Um, and the other thing is the diversity of things to go and look at. Um, so in the middle of winter, we have what's known as the galactic core. So um, that's another way of saying the middle of the Milky Way is at its most visible. So it's the densest part of our night sky. And we can see it just using our naked eye if we go out on a clear night. Um, but when we observe that through a telescope, it's quite a rich and profound experience. Um, the other advantage is because we have really cold, really clear, really stable air, we're able to look at 
uh, what we refer to as a celestial object. So that could be a planet or a cluster of stars or all sorts of cool stuff out in outer space. We're able to see them in very rich and very fine detail. So this time of year, we've got a number of planets that start to rise. So they become visible to us relatively early in the night. Um, so Saturn, Jupiter, Mars are all really, really hot at the moment and we're able to see them. Um, and then of course we have Matariki um, or the Pleiades constellation which rises and of course that's got a really important uh, cultural and, and spiritual significance um, to our Māori ancestors. Uh, is climate change a worry for those who operate winter activities? Look for us, uh, yeah, it's a very real problem. Um, one of the, the challenges we have is the frequency of clear nights. So how often can we go out and observe the night sky without there being too much cloud, too much haze, or light pollution getting in the way? And of course, as temperatures rise, what happens is more water evaporates, that water cools down, forms clouds. So we used to experience 30 years ago, 80%, 90% clear nights, and that's now down to about 70%. What is absolutely impacting our ability to run astro-tourism operations <laughs> Um, but it also has a scientific impact, which is the observatory down here finds it harder to do meaningful research as frequently as they might have done in the past. So it's a very real concern for us and it's a very real consideration. Climate change is a concern. I know the ski fields are um, for, um, investing in sophisticated uh, snowmaking um, systems to um, support whatever Mother Nature gives us. But you know, you look out today, literally outside my window, and the snow's right down to the lake levels, to the edge of the lake. So you think on a wonderful day like today that, um, if, you know, we've, we've got perfect conditions around us. Um, but um, there's no doubt about it that the snow levels will, the numerous reports that snow levels will rise over the years. And um, we will just have to adapt for um, the industry as, you know, as we can. And we've been talking about it for a long time. I started off my ski days, funny enough, up at Whakapapa, which is another great um, ski area, Tongariro. And um, we were talking about how long, this is like 30 years ago, Mother Nature would um, be kind to us. And yeah, technology um, it can replace some of that snow. And um, I, I feel confident that you know that by the you know over the next 20 or 30 years further advancements will will, will be made yeah well um you know you're right the, the the major ski fields do invest in snowmaking technology which can sort of get you through provided that the temperatures are low enough of course if it doesn't snow um mm -hmm. i guess the thing about new zealand what makes the new zealand winter experience quite unique is that we've got a you know a, a reasonably diverse ski proposition we've got the small club fields and we've got the large commercial fields. My concern in the sort of medium, uh, near to medium future is that the um, the club fields will find it increasingly hard to provide a, a reasonable length of season that can keep them going. So that's a big concern. The commercial fields uh, will continue to invest in snowmaking and, and, and offset that change that's coming uh, as long as they possibly can. But it is a, it is a, it is a worry for sure. Um, you know, we've had seasons where, you know, the, the you know, you don't go back too far in the 80s, 70s and 80s, where we were seeing snow on the ground in ski fields in May. Uh, and now we're kind of getting to the point where it's mid, mid June, late June before, you know, some of the ski fields are getting their first bits of snow to ski on. So, you know, that's definitely, um, we're seeing a change. Uh, we've been told to expect this. Um, some of the ski fields are investing to try and mitigate that. But the reality is it's going to be difficult. Uh, and also we've got to continue to look at ways that we can do things like make snow in a sustainable way. So that's uh, most of the ski fields now are looking very carefully at how uh, how they're making snow, where they're getting their energy from for that process, uh, because there's no point us making snow and then creating another problem, which is adding to adding to the carbon emissions, for example, and accelerating that process. So there is a real big focus now uh, across the industry to start measuring the impact and also getting out there and doing something to offset our emissions. Most of those emissions are around uh, groom operations. Um, and uh, obviously we're also using power for our lifts and snowmaking, but we've got to look at that power, where it's coming from. We've got to support activities and initiatives locally and across the nation to, um, to reduce the emissions that we're producing. So that's really key to us now. Is seasonal staffing an issue for our winter activities? Um, I understand that we, um, the, the, the ski fields here are pretty much do have their staff. 
but however, having said that, it is an issue across the board, um, very difficult. Um, a lot of our people, we are reliant on people on short term or migrant or working visas of some description and a lot of those people have either gone home or to other parts of New Zealand so we're very much encouraging them to come back. Um, we're starting a hub here in uh, Queenstown uh, we will work with um, employers and um, people wanting to find work here um, to um, marry them up so yes so watch that space and we're always looking to encourage people to come to uh, this part of the world and have a fabulous, um, you know, winter working holiday. Yeah, very similar challenges here in the Mackenzie uh, and in Takapo, um, similar to Queenstown, Otago. Um, historically, very dependent on uh, short-term seasonal workers uh, on on visas, um, and as you can imagine, finding um, people like astrotourism guides uh, and astronomers uh, are quite scarce. They come from all over the world to live and work in a place like Takapo. Uh, and of course, COVID has has uh, seen many of them return home. Um, so uh, that means that we have started to investigate things like employment pathways. So how can we create um, job opportunities for people with a level of interest um, rather than with a level of experience? So that's quite an exciting time for us, albeit a challenging one. Uh, and then I think universally uh, across this part of the country, uh, we've found finding and, and retaining hospitality staff to be really difficult um, so if you're looking for i mean duty managers here um, you just about name your price and um, they're extremely scarce uh, and also restaurant kitchen staff has, has been a real challenge for us and that's likely to continue um, although i believe that our ski fields have been quite successful uh, in building the the workforces they need um, although i don't know what it's like uh, for you james but um, some of the local ski fields here have <laughs> had a hard time attracting instructors and that's the mm. big challenge at the moment um, is finding people to teach with the borders closed um you know getting people in to do jobs that historically were done by overseas workers you know it has become a, a real issue we've had to rethink how things are happening you know here in methven and canterbury we've got a slightly better sort of pool of uh, uh, of of uh, people that we can reach into with christchurch being quite close um, but we still have the same challenges and, and the way to face that, of course, is to look at your business and look at what are those opportunities that you're providing people uh, when they come mm -hmm. to work with you uh, and making um, the positions that you have as attractive as possible. So it's not just the job, but as, as you mentioned, Jared, it's the pathway, it's what qualifications can someone put, pick up whilst they're working for you, what are the, the other benefits that come from working with you, whether it's transport or lunches or whatever else it is. Um, working out accommodation deals, those sorts of things are really important. We're going to have to continue to work at that. We do, um, you know, surveys mid-season, end of season. We take those apart and look at what our staff are telling us and going, right, what do we do to make ourselves, you know, the employer of choice? And, uh, you know, you just have to keep looking at that, keep on thinking about, well, how do we address those things? Because it just gets harder and harder to attract good people to your business. Um, but if you if you keep working at it, you keep looking at the data, you keep on uh, thinking outside the square, I think there are solutions out there. It's just that you can't sit back and expect things to be the same as what they were. How do you think New Zealand ranks as a winter destination uh, when we compare it to other destinations? I think we're pretty spoiled, to be honest. And I know that sounds like a cliche thing to say and like a bit of... Um, blatant self-promotion uh, but when you think about other destinations globally uh, that have a strong winter proposition they tend to have a relatively small appeal um, so it might be skiing or snowboarding and that's kind of the shtick whereas if you look at New Zealand from north to south the sheer range of activities you can participate in here through our winter months is, I think, quite unparalleled um, on the global stage, um, perhaps comparable to somewhere like Japan, where we have a huge amount of cultural diversity, um, we have a huge amount of ethnic diversity, we have a huge amount of attractions both in the event space and the activities space. And the further south you go, um, the more appealing um, the winter proposition becomes, I think. So if you're starting in the north, where you might still be warm, comfortable, you've got great big cities, you've got a range of activities um, that you can participate in. 
pit stop at Ruapehu um, to go for a bit of a ski or a snowboard if they've got some. And then further south, as you get into Canterbury and Otago, the frequency of those winter offerings just starts to improve. Um, and I think that you can really spend a lot of time in a lot of places across Aotearoa doing different things throughout the winter season. Whereas in other parts of the world, you might choose to base yourself in one particular location. You're up the same mountain or the same group of mountains every day for five or six days. Whereas down here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, you can start in the north, finish in the south and be doing something different every day. And I think that makes us really unique. Um, I also think we're super accessible. See, never more than two or three hours from an airport. So you can get around here and you can get around here comfortably uh, and, uh, and confidently as well. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree, you know, that New Zealand's got a huge offering, you know, from you mentioned before, James, about the uh, club fields, um, right to large international um, ski fields, such as the ones that we've um, got here in the, well, right from um, 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 Mount Hutt downwards, down south. Um, and we've got, you know, so you've got that sort of unique boutique on mountain experience if you want to call it that to somewhere like Queenstown where we've got an off mountain um, very cosmo uh, cosmopolitan um, you know offering right across the board in terms of hospitality restaurants a uh, plethora of other activities to do so you know when you look at some say for example even uh, North American locations is it's pretty much you're there in the ski season to ski you know even in some of the most famous resorts and the the offering is certainly not as broad as what is what you can get um, in New Zealand. And I think the offering is very different, Anne, as well, because you um, mm. you ski at a, a Whistler Blackcomb or a you know a Dolomites, you know, massive infrastructure lifts for every you know everywhere you go. Um, it's just miles and miles of skiing, and it's great. You know, don't take that away. But the thing that um, that happens when you arrive in New Zealand, smaller fields. But you get a much, I guess, more personalised service, and yeah. uh, you know, ski operators mm -hmm. in New Zealand tend to own from the start of the access road right through to the, you know, arrivals, rentals, um, onto the snow, the lift operations, right through into your food and beverage and everything. So that whole experience is overseen and and, and quite, you know, amazingly um, put together in a way that people feel really welcome right through. Now you don't get that elsewhere around the world. We have different operators running the fields, own the land, run the lifts, you know, it's it's a real disparate setup. And so there's not that joined up experience where you go Phil and you feel welcome. So if you look at things like our net promoter score, for example, in New Zealand for our ski fields versus overseas, guests are telling us that they're feeling mm. like they're getting a great experience, despite the fact that our fields aren't as extensive, it's, mm. it's an end to end amazing experience. And then of course, as soon as you get off the hill, everyone's working their socks off down in the towns to make sure those guests stay around because their lives yeah. depend on it. So, yeah. you know, their livelihoods depend on it. So, um, you know, I think with that, um, you know, we are able to offer quite, something quite unique on the world stage um, and, and very different. And that's what will get people here. And I think, uh, you know, we've got a lot of potential moving forward. Now let's head to the ice cold slopes of Mount Ruapehu for a career pathway story dictated by a passion for the snow. Kia ora, Shane Buckingham, Head of Grooming here at Whakapapa. I look after the snow grooming fleet here. We have seven of these machines and they manicure the snow so you can ski and snowboard on. This is my 27th season here on the Monga. I started back when I was 14 around that Tura and how I got into it was through my father. Now he's still driving, he's Dennis Buckingham and he's coming up to almost 40 seasons. Yeah, he loves every minute of it. Um, he's actually just turned 70. So yeah, really good, really proud of my dad. And uh, my brother, Craig Buckingham, he's been doing about for 30 something seasons now too. So I guess it runs in the family, as you would say. I, I guess the appeal to it was when you're little, five and six and your know, older brother was coming up with your dad at night time it's the, the winter wonderland what we got up here so that's how i sort of got the itch of course i've got, I've got two children now a six year old and a four year old and hey if they want to follow in dad's footsteps so be it oldest one six brighton he's six and he's really into skiing now so we tried to make the most of it and get him up here and get him into um, happy valley and he's doing really well and just loving that side of things with the family now i love skiing and that was the passion and the drive and i, I guess you just can't beat the 
this environment. I've been overseas, I've done a couple of seasons in Europe and uh, Switzerland and one in Japan, but this is home to me. You just can't leave this place. Love every year. It's the challenge, it's the, the people, it's the place, the environment, the whole manner of this mountain. It's unbelievable. If you're going to sign up tomorrow and become a snowcat operator, it takes about two to three seasons to hone in all your skills to get everything right from preparing the slopes to building a T-bar line or a load area or unload area to get it right. So over my time here, 27 seasons, you, you have a lot of, I've had a lot of opportunities, not just uh, sitting in a snow cat. You get uh, to be a duty manager that opens and shuts the ski field and puts out lots of lots of comms to everyone, so everyone's on the same page. Uh, you get to do lots of training with, uh, obviously with the machines, you get to go on courses with Puston Bully overseas. So I had the opportunity to go to the factory in Germany to do some training there and we get to do a lot of from hydraulic training to how to evac yourself off a chairlift with a bit of rope and harness to first aid training to helicopter training we do we use a lot of the helicopter up here so you name it we actually do it to even driver training in the car and on snow and ice there's definitely avenues to expand your horizons as such it's not just you're just going to be on a in a snow groomer and that's it you can do multiple tasks so you can be a master of lots <laughs> If you're going to work in the ski industry, be open mind. You've got a lot of pathways to go down. Yeah, just make friends and enjoy and suck it all in. It never gets old up here. Every season's totally different to the one before. And we're always learning. I'm always learning. You get to meet people. And it is about the people in place. 